Thank you, David, for the kind introduction. So we've been told we've got 15 minutes each uh, to occupy you. Um, we'll see. Uh, and I think we're going to be hauled off after 15 minutes. So if we can try and keep to, well, I, I will try and keep, therefore, to within 15 minutes to give some time for questions. Uh, and perhaps you might remind me when my 15 minutes is closing. Uh, so I would like to save some questions. But if we don't have time to get through all the questions, I think it's the plan to gather us together a bit at the end and have a bit more of an open discussion. So let's see. So the, my brief to talk to you uh, this afternoon is about energy storage uh, and the, the opportunities and challenges that we have around energy storage. And just to set some context for that, so I'm an electrochemical engineer and my research group specializes in electrochemical technologies. Uh, so I'm going to focus mainly on those uh, today, but there are other technologies for energy storage that you might want to ask some questions about. Um, to set some context, and it might be, and it's particularly contextual for energy storage, but it might have some context for others in the room talking about other technologies. Uh, this is a, a flow through of the, en the energy that flows through the UK's energy system, just to set some context. Uh, and this is, uh, we have an awful lot of focus, and we're going to talk a bit about today, I'm sure, about decarbonizing electricity and the importance of electricity as a decarbonizing vector. Uh, but the energy flows through the, our, our, our electricity system is actually relatively small compared to the energy that flows through our energy system as transport fuels, primarily oil-based, or uh, natural gas, primarily, but not entirely, for heat. And that's an important context because the drivers for energy storage are really how do we transition what is essentially a fossil-based economy still today, over 80% of our primary energy supplies from fossil, to a low-carbon system, and, of course, in particular, what are the opportunities for uh, decarbonized electricity to shift into the transport sector for electric vehicles, for example, uh, or for heat through things like heat pumps, and some of the system challenges that flow from that in terms of balancing supply and demand. Because just simplistically, we can see, you know, if we, want to, if we look at the heat, the energy flowing as natural gas per se heat as around a peak of, say, 2,400 gigawatt hours, if we want to move all of that into electricity and deliver it with a heat pump with, say, a coefficient of performance of four, so that's four units of heat per unit of electricity, we'd need 600-odd extra gigawatt hours if we're just going to deliver the peak load. And that's not far off the current installed asset base, generating asset base. So you can see the scale of the challenge uh, is quite significant. And you can also quickly see that if that's what we do, we're not going to utilize that investment for much of the year when we don't need the heat. So there are some, some tricky challenges around shifting supply and demand and the importance of technologies that help you with that. And energy storage is one of those. It's not the only one. Uh, so this is some work from a colleague of mine, Professor Goran Strabak, who's here at Imperial in Electrical Engineering. And it's worth just a moment's reflection because what Goran's done, this is a piece of work for the Committee on Climate Change, and he's looked at the value of flexible technologies. And a key characteristic of the stuff I'm interested in is around technologies that deliver flexibility to the system. Uh, and, and batteries are one example of a technology that deliver flexibility. And what he's done in this work is he's looked at uh, some careful analysis of what you would need to build in the UK to produce a stable uh, electricity system capable of delivering either 50 or 100 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour as our target power generation carbon footprint in 2030. Uh, and he's looked at it characterized in two ways. A low flexibility system in which there isn't much ability to time shift supply and demand, or a high flexibility system in which there is. Uh, and it's a cost optimized answer based on government numbers for the cost of different technologies. And if one changed those numbers, you get a different answer, of course. But that's what it's based on, British government numbers. And the high flexibility system well, the cost optimum answer is quite a lot of renewables. So that's PV and wind. There's a little bit of conventional gas in there as well. The non-flexible answer, well, the cheapest thing to do is to build lots of nuclear with open cycle gas turbines. They both hit the target. Uh, you can see the installed generating capacity here is much higher than the installed generating capacity here because this has intermittency. But this system is £4 billion pounds che a year cheaper to build than that one based on the government costs, and that's because nuclear is expensive. If you go to an even more ambitious target of 50 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, you get a similar answer in terms of the type of system, but now this is 8 billion pounds a year cheaper to build than that. 
Okay, and what that's telling you is that the value of flexibility, and it's in my case, I'm interested in batteries and energy storage technologies and store technologies that give you flexibility. This is the headroom on the budget that you might choose to invest to save money as UK PLC. There are lots of interesting regulatory challenges around how you access that value that we might want to talk about in conversation, but I'm not going to go into it other than to say that. So uh, if you look at the type of services that energy storage can offer uh, to electricity systems, there is a multiplicity of different services. And those services have different value streams associated with them, uh, and they take many forms. The one we often think about is energy arbitrage, where we can store electricity, say, when the price of generation is low, and sell it when the price is high. And that's true, there's value in that, but it's a relatively small part of the total value stream. There are many other parts, including deferred investment in different assets, frequency response, and so on. The message to take from this is that there's lots of different requirements for the, um, the uh, power of the energy store and the size of the energy storage tank. So this is how fast you can fill it and empty it, and this is how big it is. And so we need different technologies with different characteristics to provide different services. So you can look at it in a slightly different way. So this is the size of the tank. This is the ability to, um, uh, uh, to fill and empty the tank. So there are some technologies that can allow us to fill and empty the tank very quick, things like flywheels and supercapacitors. Uh, there are some that allow us to store lots of energy for large amounts of time, for example, storing energy in molecules through making hydrogen by electrolysis from renewables, for example, uh, or, or other chemical bonds. Uh, there's some that are intermediate, like, so this is pumped hydro, which of course is a current incumbent, compressed air energy storage, flow batteries, and in here, the sorts of batteries that you might be more familiar with, so lithium-ion batteries, and a panoply of other uh, electrochemical options uh, that allow us to store at these sorts of intermediate times uh, and, and um, speeds. Okay, so one of the take-home messages are for energy storage for low-carbon grids, there are many storage options. It's not all about lithium-ion batteries, though clearly lithium-ion batteries are important. And so we've mentioned lithium-ion batteries, so let's talk about lithium-ion batteries. Lots of interest in lithium-ion batteries, lots of interesting scientific and engineering challenges with lithium-ion batteries. Um, we wrote a report on some of these technologies, and I've just lifted some evidence from it. Uh, so you will hear things from Tesla saying, we will get to $100 a kilowatt hour with our gigafactories, a very ambitious uh, aim. Not, that's not where things are at the moment, but they're getting cheaper. If you buy a Tesla Powerwall, this is a Tesla Powerwall to port in your home to connect to your solar power. That's about £540 per kilowatt hour today if you go online and find someone to install it for you. Uh, so it's, it's going down in price, but it's still not cheap. And if you look at the economic argument for that, it's pretty tough today as a homeowner. Uh, lifetime with lithium-ion batteries can be a challenge. They don't necessarily have as many cycles in them as you would like. They degrade every time you use one. Um, you need quite sophisticated battery management and control systems to avoid uh, safety incidents and fires and so on. Clearly, you can do that, but it's, it's an interesting both challenge and opportunity for the technology. If we're looking at large batteries for grid applications, we might start to be concerned about our lithium availability. And that's driving quite a lot of interest for grid applications in sodium ion batteries. So one of the areas to keep an eye on is sodium ion rather than lithium ion if you're interested in uh, uh, this sort of battery technology for grid applications. Sodium's heavier than lithium. It's not so good for consumer devices or transport, but it's a lot cheaper and more abundant uh, than, uh, than lithium, and therefore that brings some advantages. And there's some nice technology in companies like Faradion, a UK company that are active in sodium ion batteries in the UK. If I look at a different type of technology, and this is a quick snapshot journey through the panoply of different options, because that's all we've got time for, I'd like to highlight flow batteries. So what's a flow battery? In a flow battery, you produce, you store your energy in the form of a reduced or oxidized form of some form of chemical couple. A classical flow battery is made out of vanadium. It has a vanadium electrolyte. Vanadium can sit in four oxidation states. So you can have a 2-3 couple and a 4-5 couple. So when you want to store energy, you produce the reduced form, vanadium-2, and the oxidized form, vanadium-5. And you store those as a liquid in a tank. And if you want more energy, you have a bigger tank. So that's cheap, right? You just need more vanadium. Vanadium's not that cheap, but tanks are cheap. 
Uh, and that allows you to have decouple this issue of power and energy. Now, if you want 10 times the energy from a lithium-ion batteries, you need 10 times as many batteries. For a flow battery, if you want 10 times the energy, you just need a slightly bigger tank. And that has some economic scaling benefits. This is the world's largest battery. This is being built in China at the moment, in Dalian, uh, in China, just north of Beijing. It's a 200 megawatt, 800 megawatt hour vanadium flow battery. Uh, and it's a really interesting, because flow batteries have some interesting characteristics. I can't remember what, I didn't put that slide in. So they have interesting characteristics, whereas a lithium-ion battery you might cycle several thousand times. Flow batteries you can cycle tens of thousands of times. Whereas a lithium-ion battery you can't deep, fully discharge a flow battery you can. Of course, they have some disadvantages. They're currently more expensive than lithium-ion batteries have got to, and their energy density is low. You wouldn't put one of these in a car, whereas you could conceive of putting a lithium-ion battery clearly in a car or in a much smaller footprint. So it depends what you're trying to achieve. Uh, I'm interested to see, and I didn't know this was going to happen actually, but you're seeing our latest spin-out company in this space, RFC Power. It's one of the posters uh, available later. And we just formed this business. It's based on manganese hydrogen flow battery technology. So instead of vanadium, we use manganese. We use some clever, ke clever chemistry to stabilize the manganese couple in solution from my colleague, Anthony Kusinak, in the chemistry department. And we have a closed hydrogen loop on the other electrode. So it's a bit like a fuel cell electrolyzer on one side and a manganese liquid system on the other. And we think this gives us significant cost savings over all vanadium. And we've just, just formed a business to try and take that forward. And you can talk to the guys later. The final one I want to talk to you about is about storing energy in chemical bonds. So this is around hydrogen. Lots of emerging interest in, in hydrogen today. Uh, there was a lot of interest in it sort of 10, 15 years ago that never went anywhere. But the benefits of hydrogen or the potential benefits that hydrogen brings to the system in terms of its ability to store large amounts of energy for long periods of time, to couple uh, electrons from renewables with molecules which you can put down pipes. Uh, these are making it a potentially interesting option in the UK as well for potentially as a source of low carbon gas for industrial heat, for example, or possibly even residential heat is of interest. So there's increasing interest in the role of hydrogen in the system. And this is a, 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 my closing slide, I think, from the Energy Technologies Institute. And they've looked at the potential for storing hydrogen in underground salt caverns, where you can store very large amounts of energy for very long periods of time that you might choose to do to manage, for example, the winter dip in wind energy that we get in the northern hemisphere where the wind goes down for several weeks in the middle of winter and you need relatively large secure uh, storage to back that up. Might sound a bit far-fetched but we store hydrogen this way today. We store large amounts of natural gas this way today. We also store hydrogen this way for the pet in some places for petrochemical sector. So it's, it's not a new technology. Uh, it would be a new application of an existing technology. So that's all I wanted to say. I think I've probably got two minutes left. There we go. Uh, so what I hope I've emphasized is that services in general that deliver flexibility are going to have increasing value as we seek to decarbonize the energy system, particularly as we decarbonize through low carbon electrons. Storage is one of the technologies that service that flexibility. It's not the only one. Demand side management, flexible generation and interconnection all uh, contribute to that. Uh, for, for grids, then we'll, we will need storage services, some for power, some for energy, and that's going to drive us to a range of options. It's lithium-ion batteries are important, but they're not the only important game in town uh, because we need technologies that are capable of sufficiently long lifetimes at sufficiently low cost and which are safe to deploy in, a, in, in um, urban and residential environments. So there are significant opportunities for innovation. I've touched on one or two of the chemistry and science innovations there's also engineering innovations around control systems, thermal management systems, and business model opportunities as well for innovation. So that's it. Finished.